Shit. Okay, Terry Haggerty, beautiful roll. What are we smoking? <laughs> Deja it's, vu. <laughs> it's a 1969 Colombian Chiba leaf, which was Colombian Chiba. You know, pretty much Sansamilla, Colombian, and uh, it was really dark red, almost black. And uh, you sometimes you get like a five pound block, and it would only be about like this big and about that thick, and just goo. But the stuff was so amazing even back then. Like I remember the first time I smoked it, rolled a joint, and I took about two pokes, and I literally went away, and I came back, and I was just sitting there holding the joint. And <laughs> I said, you know what? I'm going to save these seeds because these are amazing seeds. Right. And it was the feeling that, made, that you wanted to capture so yeah, you could recreate. Yeah, and because I love plants and love gardening and, and was kind of you know, really interested in anything botany. The seeds of marijuana were as interesting to me as the marijuana itself. And when you really started looking at them, how they looked, and you know, relative to what the herb was, it's. I just kind of knew that basically. With uh, back then, it was like President Nixon and Paraquat and Operation Intercept and all those different things that they were doing at the time that probably indigenous people growing indigenous weed was not long for this world. So I just thought it might be nice to keep every good strain of pot. And that was you know, pre-clones or even a lot of hybridizing anything. It was just like, you know, the thought of being able to grow anything halfway close to that, as good as that herb was, was uh, a good idea, you know? And you had that background of botany. Yeah, and you were you were the man. You were the guy to, to do that, and you did, obviously. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was really a love of uh, just a just a love of growing things. Yeah. And just to note to the viewers out there who are going to watch this, Paraquat was that they used to spray on the weed crops to poison us. Yeah. No, it's like an herbicide, where it probably the uh, precursor to 2,4-D. You know. But anyway, yeah, no, those were bad times. That was, it looked like Herb was a goner. And then, basically, uh, Thai weed started showing up. And then the rest of the world, you know, started introducing pot here. And, uh, and so what did you do with those, those Thai strains that came in? Did you capture that as well? Did you hybridize? You know and what? I haven't kept a lot of Thai strains. I uh -huh. like Thai, but I just, for some reason, it didn't have... Uh, I like the uh, North American genome, you know, I like the high of it. It's one of the things I've always said about the herb that I grow, and not to be too graphic, but if it doesn't make you want to play your instrument or have sex, I have no need to grow it, mm. uh, you know? I, I didn't necessarily God. want to get smashed. No, yeah. that's exactly it though, isn't it? And, and you could drift from one to the other, you know? I have this beautiful postcard of this work of art where, um, the woman is lying there, sultry and naked, and the guy is is clothed and he's playing. Uh -huh. and I just love that juxtaposition. It's like you, you want to play or you want to have the sex or like if you can figure out and combine them, yeah. great. Maybe we're just warming up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, it's a beautiful thing. So, I mean, what kind of vault are you talking about here these strains that you have is this just a few private blends that you've hybridized or have you been you able to i've got uh, yeah i've got you know a lot of early sativas from you know mexico and colombia and uh have some of the uh hash plants from uh, the late uh late 60s from uh, Af Afghanistan, Afghanistan yeah. Afghani hash, gold seal. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know how we used to end up with some of that in high school in the 80s. I don't know how we got it. We got our little share. Even you know? in Washington. Yeah, yeah. And I have a variety that I called KAM, which is uh, I uh, took a lot of my genetics to friends that were living in Kona. 
in Hawaii. And Hawaii, and so a few de uh, hybrids were developed there among the uh, mm. initially the land races that I brought there that got crossed in Hawaii. And from uh, the Colombian. Yeah, well, from the Col Colombian, what and so what that ended up being called was K A M. So and. I had this variety of African that was pretty good, not great, but it was nice. And it came in at about 1974. And uh, they would almost look like Oaxacan bundles, which were round. They'd have the colitas in there, and they'd round them, they'd wrap them in these bundles. But the, from Africa, from that Durban area, they were round, but they were wrapped in banana leaves. And then they took each bundle of those banana leaves and then they put them in a big container and then they just pressed it all down, like it went really hard. So that these things that were round ended up being square and about half the size. But the herb was unique and it was a stima and it was definitely different. So I kept those seeds. Mm. What was different about it? It uh, was more narcotic and less electric. Mm, okay. But you know, it's just part of the electric thing could have just been the way that it was processed and I'm not quite sure how long it sat in the big giant bundle of pot, but how long it sat there before it actually ended up being smoked. Mm -hmm. Like coal coming into a tank. Yeah, well it wasn't, it wasn't so dry that you couldn't smoke it, but it was, you know, it was still greasy enough where you had to peel it apart. And, and it was consummate, it had some seeds. You not completely sound to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I started growing it, basically. I played in a band called Sons of Champlin for a long time, so every, even though I was growing plants since the uh, late 60s, I really didn't have any extensive growing because I was on the road all the time. Mm. But uh, when, the sun, when the suns broke up in 1977, then I actually started taking growing more seriously and started you know, growing up in the water company with a friend because it was so illegal. But we would grow, you know, like 50 pounds a year up there. And uh, I would grow these seeds that I had that were a combination of the Hawaiian seeds and uh, crosses that I'd made between the... Uh, the affy and the uh, and the sativas, and then I'd grow a few sativas. I gave a friend of mine, Rob Clark, who's really a, a fabulous, you know, ethnobotanist, and I gave him a copy of one of my earliest patches, which was I think like 1982. And in it, you have like in the background, there's these pure, pure sativas, just the thinnest leaves, all tall. And then in the front, there's all these, like, you know, Afghani plants, like with big, broad leaves, and, and, but small and squat. Mm, and then in the middle was the very first hybrid that I'd made out of those things. And it's just, it looks like really modern pot that you see now, you know. Really dense, but God, it was great. It just, yeah. Well, m a lot of my pot's still that way. So, so now are most of the sativas always high altitude and the indicas lower altitude? That was my experience, okay. but I don't know if that's the truth. You know? And the sativas always were narrow? Yeah, the narrow. And they were really narrow. I mean, there's nothing that I've seen and nothing that I have that is, has as narrow leaves as uh, the sativas that I saw back there. Yeah. So it's interesting when I had my stuff genome mapped and stuff. It's a large, large portion of, of the land race. And, and I've got my stuff on the Phylos uh, galaxy. So this thing that we're just smoking here, they've kind of triangulated the Colombian part of it. it. The Affy part doesn't come up so much, but I know that it's in there. And uh, yeah, this one was just tested at uh, 31% THC and is and almost 1% THCV and 1.5% THCG. OG. So, OG. No, so, honestly, I'm not, yeah. I'm not a huge smoker. I'm more of an edibles guy because I yeah. usually don't get affected by well, smoking. Said, and I'm, but I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's definitely a considerable yeah. high. Absolutely. I know. 
not the first thing we've smoked today, but it, yeah. you feel it when you smoke yeah. it. It's a bit, yeah. the, the G, you know, there's speculation on what, you know, what means what, but it seems like the G has the potential to be the happy molecule. Mmm, so the happy molecule. G, <laughs> But just to, to be the keeper of such precious resource for mm -hmm. us, you know, God-given resource of a plant, the simplicity of a plant. The intent is to, uh, I guess my last number of years has been, it's almost like reverse engineering some of my seed lines because like I have a variety now that's, half of the initial genetics were from Michoacan. And I've bred it for the Michoacan traits now for so many generations that it's just almost purely taken on the characteristics of that beautiful flavor that the Michoacan used to have and the gold and the, just the long sativa plant. And it took a long time to get it there, but that's, you know, it, and the high is really wonderful. And, uh, you know, about 26, 27% THC. So do you want to talk about, are you like gearing up to market this in any way? Or is this, you know, your own personal contribution to mankind that you've, you've well, you know stored I've, these I've strains, always, the I've seeds? I've always thought about it, <laughs> that that's my responsibility. Okay. And, uh, but that said, I would like to make a little something off of it. And the jury goes out, is out as far as it's either of great value or people aren't that educated about marijuana to where it really matters one way or another. And probably what I'd want for it is probably a lot more than somebody would want to give me. Mm. But you know, you're in a really unique position having come with such a strong wine industry background to help people understand how your terroir and all of this really is vastly different depending on, you know, this. Oh, they're exactly, industry. they're the exact same thing. Or and even more so because of these very special traits. And that's why I've always thought that what would, should really go along, whether it's recreational or medicinal, and coming from the standpoint of it's all medicinal, mm -hmm. is really for who's ever growing white, it's like, this is what this, it, how this is going to impact you. This is what's going to do for this, uh, you're tired or you're having this problem. The more people know about that, the more it's going to, I think, impact mm -hmm. you know, their I buying and, and also the value of the product. You know, I, th I think that's the case. And one of the things that I like, I've always had this model of uh, aged marijuana. So over the years, mm -hmm. because I take my herb and I put it in uh, like little bags and I put them in seal bags and then I seal them I suck the air down pretty tight and then I put them in another bag and I seal that down and then I put them in a cool dark place, you know, no refrigerated or anything, just, just cool. And over the years I've managed to have uh, versions of the types that I grow now, which, you know, the primary ones, there's four or five. And I have... Uh, nice bags of all those varieties going back to 2012. And when you open them up and you smoke them and the, the seals are unbroken, they've just been sealed up for, you know, what, eight years. And they're fabulous. Yeah. Aged, aged and So my thought was that if I ever actually went into the, you know, in, into the business of marketing it, you know, under the name Hagalicious, that uh, that would be one of the really nice things because it would never be a lot. And at some point I could really start offering like, you know, just like wine, like aged. It's varieties. boutique, yeah. it's boutique, yeah. it's, it's heritage, it's heirloom, you know, yeah, it's strains. It's yeah, and that's the way I see that. it. <laughs> so one of the things that, you know, in monetizing that people, you know, people got capable of helping me have said that they wanted to start a small club, you know, like 50 people, music business people, you know, people that I know. And uh, it's a beautiful model, except for it's illegal. <laughs> so 
uh, that laws don't allow you to do that yet. So every place I've gone, they say, well, all you need is a lot of money and some legislators on your side. Then you can do that. So that's mm -hmm. a win in a way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and there are, there are giant, giant forces out there. It's, it's easy to forget and put that aside when we're ready to pursue our dreams and the new cannabis, you know, green rush, as they're calling it. But there are the Philip Morris international size operations out there with there are millions of acres being grown and, and ready for this whole thing. And so it, if you think about it, like trying to put out a cigarette brand up against the Marlboros, Camels, and you know, yeah. American spirits of the world, it's, uh, it's a David and Goliath story. But there are those who will have a market, like you said, like with fine wines, like with something that's exclusive and boutique. And there is a market for that. There is uh, capital out there funding luxury goods. Well, I <laughs> and it's, it's a another one. As long as, the, uh, as long as you could possibly imagine of you know, pretty well-known people and entertainers that have all smoked Cagalicious and gone, oh, shit. Don't ever let me smoke that again before we go on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And just give me one after the gig's over. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Now, one of, one of my one of my proudest moments with the uh, with growing marijuana was like uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I was married to a really fabulous woman and a school teacher out in uh, in Marin County. And uh, I was growing it out there, not a lot, but I had a greenhouse and I was growing it. And the police were so all over it in the, in the fall, they would come and they'd literally fly right down on top of the greenhouse and try to blow the panels off of it. Because, you know, there was really, they could do whatever they want, you know. They'd fly all around and guys would get out on the, on the runners with the big super high powered magnifying goggles and try to look in between the crack of the roof and uh, with a little air vent to see if they could see pot and they're taking pictures all the time and stuff. So my wife being a, uh, a teacher, she basically just said, you know, you just can't do this anymore. This is just so crazy ass, you just can't do this anymore. So uh, it was really just like, you know, really unfair of me to jeopardize your job like that because, you know, yeah. like we're talking in the 80s and, uh, and it was a pretty uh, right-wing area where we were. And, uh, but one thing led to another and uh, I got busted. Mm -hmm. And uh, cultivation. Well, yeah, cultivation initially, and uh, then uh, there might there might have been a couple other herb things that I did that didn't have to do with me growing it, <laughs> and somebody had uh, rolled on me. So as it turns out, the uh, it was a woman who had rolled over on me, and she was the wife of this one guy that I'd done a couple of transactions with. Mm. And unbeknownst to me, the guy had started taking cocaine and, and bought a bunch of guns and started beating his wife. And she got to the point where she couldn't take it anymore and she just got his, his address book, turned everybody in the hole. She said, they're all dirty, you know. And so I just, all of a sudden, I came under <sighs> this, this big major indictment on this wave of indictments. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and it was really a pretty amazing thing. So I guess the whole point of the story was having lived through that and uh, hypothetically speaking, if I had made any money, it was spent on lawyers. As it is. <laughs> That's another really good lesson in that. Don't beat yeah. your wife. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. terrible. Pretty much like, you know, getting to the modern day here and monetizing all this. It's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing. And you can only do it really straight up and, uh, you know, by the regulations. So that, that's the thing that makes it so hard. Cause, mm. you know. It's the business paradigm, but it's eclipsed over the government paradigm, yeah. which, which is always just such a, 
an impediment to flow and to getting things done. And you're just constantly stressed and up against roadblocks and shady characters and not knowing well, who not to so trust. Much that and it's just a matter of of, of uh, staying within the regulation so you just don't get somebody mad at you. And the main reason for me is that even though I only have a little area where I keep my genetics, I do have eight or ten mothers that have lived an awful long time that are pretty amazing genetics that I hate to have somebody come in and mess with, you know? You know, but it's just, it's this, and in some ways it's the same sort of struggle that both Ev and I have had as far as, you know, we're trying to do something very pure, trying to say that there's a way beyond this paradigm, but how do you, you know, how do you monetize stuff, keep the message pure at the same time when you're in the middle of this paradigm? You have to find this you know, balancing act in mm -hmm. some way that you can live with yourself. It hasn't bastardized your message too much. Yeah, no, my thought on it is that if, you know, if, if it unfolds where I can, you know, make a little living off of it, that would be great. And if it gets to a certain point and I'm getting older and I have what I think are pretty unique genetics and I'm just going to put the ads in the, in the Mendo papers and Humboldt papers and, Come on down and get some seeds. Johnny Apple. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I used to do that when Keeping I was it real. on the road. I did a bunch of road work with uh, uh, Steve Kimock. And mm -hmm. uh, so we'd play through Oregon and Northern California and play all these harvest festivals. And back <laughs> then, when the genetics wasn't such a big issue, I would take really big bags of seeds. Because at the end of every single gig, like, all the growers are there and they're giving everybody ounces or half pounds and you come back off the road and you might have four or five pounds. Everybody in the band would have four or five pounds of pot. <laughs> yeah. But I'd meet all these growers so I'd give them all seeds and say, you know, these are kind of hard, they mature late, but you know, they're, they're, they're really just quite, quite the pow, so you might want to give them a go. Yeah. Opportunity to do something different. Yeah. Well, there, there, is, there is the sacramental quality to it that you'd really like to think is, is being preserved. You know? But I agree with something you'd said off camera. It's like the danger, and, and I, I worry about it from the moment I really became aware of what this plant meant and the importance of it as a sacrament mm -hmm. and, and how important it is to not go down the same path we have with other things, breaking them, them down to their individual components. And I think it's just so important for everybody involved with this to not settle for, you know, THC products made from yeast and things like yeah. that. Because, as you pointed out, we don't want it to go down the path of cocaine or, or yeah. opium or anything else. Yeah, no, it is, all this stuff's going to get so concentrated at some point it's going to really be a psychosis producing mm -hmm. substance, you know. And... Uh, it's all those it's all those things in the little leaves and the, the mordant like qualities of the chlorophylls and there's so many types of chlorophylls and so many types of THCs that there's it's still not a known process how it all interacts but to really end up having that really grounded in the earth with the good feeling with your mind thinking really cool thoughts you kind of need the, the whole chemistry there you know you just can't pick a part out of it it's the flower. It's the beauty of the flower. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of the difference between the way the shaman looks at his medicine. He figures out what the earth has provided for him and how it works and how they're supposed to use it for their people. We, the Western philosophy seems to have, we got to understand, okay, not just does it work, but we've got to get to the understanding of the very smallest components of it before we'll accept that it does work. Mm -hmm. And then once we've broken it down, then we want to divide it off into different parties to make a profit off of right, it. Right. Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because my own personal experience was even though I was really fascinated by the seeds and the plant and everything like that, I was young enough where I was smoking a lot of pot and I was self-medicating very seriously because I had my own issues with my father and self-esteem issues and, you know, like things that you have going on in your late teens and 20s, you know. So coping mechanism, but it really started as a self-medication, mm -hmm. you know, thing. And as, as that kind of got resolved just by growing up and getting more mature then like, well, why exactly are you smoking this? Like, 
I don't want to smoke this kind of weed because, you know, I'd rather be out working in the garden than just kind of laying there watching TV. But this other kind of weed that basically... Enter like, sativa. I'm going to just be sitting in there and the recording machine's going to be running and I'm going to be free associating and just going to make a huge mess, so, a sonic mess. And there's going to be a couple things in there that never in my wildest dreams could I have ever made up. And there, there, there they were, like a gift, like what a cool sound, you know? And so, you know, if you just use the marijuana for the, the pure free association qualities and seeing that's such a rare commodity in the world now, you know? It's almost like the simplest organic, most organic, you know, things are the, the greatest gifts that the modern world has now because they're just so unique and rare and they just stand alone and they're, you know, their elegance, you know, and they're just ancientness, you know. They're right there, well, gifts for us to enjoy. We forgot all the stuff that's out here is modeled after something in nature first. Somehow we forgot all of that part mm -hmm. of the story. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're going, oh, that stuff that, that all came from? Yeah, that, wow, that's even cooler than the stuff we make from it. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Hey, Soul's here to listen, and uh, we're fascinated, and we are, um, God, high? yeah, we are so <laughs> high. Like, I mean, the conversation obviously can go on and on. It's not Hagalicious, it's Hagalicious, like when I was selling it to the, to the clubs where you could sell it medically and you didn't need the licenses yet, my posters would say, uh, uh, highest efficacy, Longest lasting, simply the best. Now, you know, simply the best is a marketing ploy. There's got to be other really just amazing, if not much better things. But in my experience, that seemed to really sum up my feelings about what it did, you know, because it was a thing for your intellect, you know. And you've, it's tried and true. You know, you've tested it. Like road it, tested it over the decades and decades and decades yeah, you know, you've been I've growing, been growing it. it. If <laughs> I've been growing it, even if it was only a few plants every year, since, uh, you know, 1969, what is that? 69, 79, 89, 2009, 2000, that's 50 years. I was talking to a scientist at one of these bio companies and, and we, were, uh, we were talking about the science of this. I was telling him, I says, gee, you know, I just don't have the schooling and the molecular understanding of things that you do, but my understanding of science is that it's observation. And there's definitely a lot I don't know, but I really have been looking at this for an awfully long time, probably, you know, 15 years longer than you've been alive. So uh, for whatever that's worth. Maybe less than I think, but you know. Two, two questions. Now, one, um, are there any, because we mostly think of things you know, south of the border in New Mexico as far as strains and where everything comes from. Mm -hmm. Are there any genetics that are purely North American? And not, I mean, not New Mexico, would be North American, mm -hmm. but the United States North? Not that I know. That's not to say there isn't. But, you know, one of the things that's really amazing about the North American genome is there was varieties that were so rare that were grown by the indigenous people that nobody's ever seen. And I think I have a few little batches of seeds that have yeah. some of those genetics in them. Mm -hmm. and an example is, got this, uh, only a few ounces from this woman. And she brought it up from Mexico and you know smuggled it in. And it was silver white, it was so light colored. And if you'd take just like, and it had seeds, mm -hmm. and if you just take a few buds and you put them in a baggie, almost instantly you couldn't see the pot in there because there was just so much resin on it. Wow. So, <clears throat> closest I've got to uh, recreating that is I had one of these plants from that lineage of seeds make almost square marijuana seeds. Square? Almost square like a little cube? Seeds. Yeah. yeah, really the weirdest looking thing. 
of this, and I, and I don't know what it means. I, I grew one of them, and it just wasn't even as good as I had hoped. But the fact that the seed was so mutated, and it was part of the genetic code of that really special weed. So I think a lot of things about genetics is science can really tell you a lot. And, and I think that the real scientists have real trouble with me because science is science and, and it's not like fake news or something like that. It's the underlying truth of the matter. But I'm just kind of being this, you know, self-absorbed old hippie going, you know what, I saw some things, and I know I saw them, and I'm looking for them, you know? And the other question I wanted to ask um, before we wrap up is, yeah. of, of the strains that you've gotten down in Mexico, how much, um, how long do you think those strains have existed, and how much genetics have gone on in the thousands of years as far as breeding uh -huh. and stuff with the plants? Gee, you know, I'm, my friend Rob Clark wrote a beautiful book on, on that, which kind of explains it all. I mean, it's hemp developed in China, and it was probably brought here over the land bridge by, uh, you know, the people that migrated here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think fairly quickly uh, they made it down into Mexico. So, God, I don't know. 10,000 years? To 14,000 yeah. somewhere, I yeah. Think that's the window that they have for, yeah. for it, you know. So. Well, there also seems to be proof, too, that the Egyptians may have even been over here as well from finding coca, mm -hmm. where it shouldn't have been, and some of the mummies and things. Well, those caves in South America that they yeah. found, yeah. Back yeah. to Anguitin, uh, they thought they had a little residue, cocaine residue, yeah. and, uh, and some uh, hemp seed heads. Yep, yep. Yep. I think it's that, yeah. pretty obvious as long as mankind has been aware of ethnobotany, mankind has been indulging the brain in these psychoactive plants. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, you no, know? the guy that, that, that was all mummified that they found in the Swiss Alps. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's been around a long time. And our need to get um, out of ourselves has been around for a long time. And doesn't exist in just human beings. You know, dolphins with puffer fish, goats licking frogs, and humans licking toads. Yeah, yeah. You know, you figure what once once fire occurred, maybe even before. Yeah, the, with the toads and everything like that. You know, the bufotenin. I knew a guy who basically just swore that that was the best thing that he'd ever taken in his life. You know, licking those toads in Australia. You know. But uh, he he wasn't quite right. <laughs> Makes you wonder how many you want to go lick right away. <laughs> yeah. We don't necessarily condone or recommend going out and licking any toads, you know, without really knowing what you're doing. You probably want a shaman or something on board. <laughs> Good. Well, it's always a fascinating conversation with Terry Haggerty. Souls listening, and we're fascinated with everything we hear. And yeah, well, we love having you here, and you know, we're we're gonna open things up to questions for people, and so then when we regroup, we'll have, we'll know what people want to know, and we'll pick your brain some more. You know, the thing that's so funny about it is like, and I've really tried to pay attention to the things that I've done with this, but there really does kind of span so much time, and having been stoned for so long, <laughs> that there's there's kind of like a little mythological quality in it. Hopefully that's what modern science is really going to bring to it. It's going to, it's like the genetic work that I've done over the last decade has really been specialized in a few different varieties, you know, like these these kind of things. And uh, the thing about this this variety of of the North American genome is that it changes. It it doesn't mutate per se, but it has a real rate of change in how it evolves through different expressions of itself. So when you're taking cuttings of it, you need to take enough of them where you can really actually see how they develop so you can pick the phenotypically close to pure ones for, from the mother. But the ones that are going off wherever they're going can even be more amazing. So in the, uh, you know, probably 35 years of the varieties that I've been working on now, uh, 
there's just been so many different divergent things that they've done. Like I had one cut-in turn into a, such a dense ball of leaves and, uh, and bracts. And it was just an indiscernible mass. You couldn't even see the nodes in there. It was just this glob of porcupine resiny weirdness. And it had so many, it had so many, it, it had so many leaves and the leaves were just coming out of all the buds. There was no way you could clean it. There was really no way that you could really grow it. But... Did I, you smoke any of it? It was, it was, it was, it was the parent of a whole branch of Agalicious, you know, and I was lucky enough that basically I managed to get a cutting off of it, and, uh, and it was the hardest thing to pollinate, you know, because, I mean, I just saturated in pollen, and it made like about two seeds, you know, but so, there's lot, lots of, lots of things, you know, if you take the Girl Scout cookies, and you take my kind of pot, you know, they're incompatible. It's like you can make seeds, but you have to kind of like force it along, you know, because they're just for for whatever reason that Girl Scout cookie bract and the way the the, uh, the 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 little hair coming out, the little stamen coming out. It's it's uh, hard for the hagalicious pollen to get on it, so you kind of need to paint them. They're the variable as far as what's in them that you really don't know. And, and as science is, is, uh, is just leaping forward now with all the genetic testing and, and like now that they can test the cotyledons and they can give you the sex and, the, and what's actually chemically potentially available in the plant, it's getting easier to pick the right males, you know. But, you know, through, for most of the time, it's been very hard, and that's been kind of one of the uh, things to celebrate when you found the magic male, you know. So those would be years where those particular crosses carry a lot more weight. So even though I would cross things up every six years and have a whole bunch of different varieties, and they're all in deep freeze, there's like, just like wine again, it's, there's just these banner years where the male was the right male, and so you just kind of ignore all the other ones and all your genetics are made and started from those good years. Okay. Like a fine vintage of wine. Absolutely. And you have them stored away, so it's yeah, like so a fine vintage. Yeah, so far they seem like they're fine. I have a couple of different identical, you know, boxes of seeds and two different freezers. Okay, you might as well make sure that there's backup. Yeah, yeah, and the flowers as well. And we appreciate uh, you sharing them with us today. And we're we're believers like all the way in in uh, what you're doing and the strains themselves and the philosophy behind it and the the heart that's driving it. And we're well, just it's an us as far as the philosophy, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. I mean, you get old, you get like a little bit hardened sometimes. You know, as uh, as idealistic as you can be and committed to, you know, all beings be well. You just get a little crest around you, so meeting guys like you is good for me. Yeah, yeah, we're here to melt some crust, right? because society is just laying it on so thick, and you can slough off so much, yeah. you know, with all the, you know, to the est workshops and the Buddhist mentalities, but yeah. life is a bitch to so many people, and they're living out that life's a bitch life, mm -hmm. and, and even those of us who maybe have transcended to some degree, still have to cope with all the people we care about, you know, suffering in, in a cycle of self-induced bad choices and, and, you know, just lack of vision and clarity and presence. Mm -hmm. And those of us who have, you know, been able to find whatever degree of presence that we have and, and being able to come from the heart, we're sensitive, I think, it's to... Like it's just you return to the breath or you return to the good experience that really made you believe in people. And then that's a little place inside yourself. And after having some voyage to lost land, you know, basically, I I'll feel like I always return to that place where I really love people. So yeah. it, it, it allows things to... Uh, 
it just affirms the fact that you know it's an us yeah and it's it does a, really feel like there's a tremendous opportunity right now from what we've experienced with the 50th anniversary and some of our love and the deep passion and the deep still wanting to affect change and sometimes having this really broken heart from not feeling like they did enough or they let down or they sold out to the system to have them now be influencers to join forces with this new generation who see very clearly and is not bought in before they get indoctrinated into the politics to say here's an opportunity whether it's the venus project or whatever we got to shoot off in another way only this time unlike in the 60s we're going to have a destination for people mm -hmm. to go to and another way to be mm -hmm. And there's a tremendous opportunity for those two energies to be shared at this point. Well, you can see that really good ideas do last forever, and they get built on. And, and the winnowing process is pretty brutal as far as what is a good idea. But good ideas serve society in a way that it basically prospers, you know. So. Yeah, well, let's prosper good ideas. And, well, it's the medium <laughs> of the mind now, so basically anything that's going to prosper is going to be because it allows the mind to uh, discover and express itself, so. Yeah. Terry, thank you so much. Oh, we always wrap it up. Yeah, should we wrap with some soap bugs? <laughs> <laughs>